Today's second reading is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and chapter 2, verses 5 through 12. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son who he appointed heir of all things, through, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited and more excellent than theirs. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels, but someone has testified somewhere, what are human beings that you are mindful of them or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now, in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might test, taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist in bringing many children to glory, should make pioneer of their salvation perfect through their sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Some Pharisees came <clears throat> to test Jesus, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. 
So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms and his hands and laid hands on them and blessed them. The Gospel of the Lord. and the Holy Spirit may be seated. <clears throat> I was faced with a bit of a conundrum as I was preparing this sermon. I have a sermon all prepared to talk about divorce, um, but I'm not going to do that for a very good reason, not because I've been part of a divorce, but because with what's going on in the world today, especially in our country with the disasters, I think our story, our, our poem, our reading from Job is uh, much more important. I will say this about divorce, if it's something that concerns you, <clears throat> a Dr. Philip McClarty in one of his sermons wrote the following, and just in case you didn't get it the first time around, listen up, if there's anyone here today who's laboring under the burden of guilt and shame because you're divorced, leave, leave that burden behind you. Let God dispose of it once and for all. And if you're still holding on to the hurt and anger caused by diver divorce, let that go as well. <clears throat> You've carried it long enough, and it won't do you any good to hold on to it any longer. In Christ, all is forgiven. All things are new. Let that be the good news for you for this day and evermore. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, enough said on that. I got I to tell you, though, that as I was preparing, one of my favorite little anecdotes that I found in there is there was um, two things. One, uh, they said Adam and Eve had the perfect marriage. You know why? Because Adam didn't have to hear Eve tell him of all the men she could have married. And Eve didn't have to hear how his mother cooked. <laughs> and, and, and then my favorite, my favorite involves um, uh, Churchill and Lady Astor. Apparently, they didn't like each other very much. And Lady Astor once told Churchill that if she was married to Churchill, she would poison him. And Churchill responded, if I was married to you, I'd drink it. And so, anyway, from the light side. But I really think it's important, and it's kind of lengthy, but that we, we listen to these words from Job. I mean, I had a parishioner this morning tell me when she read Job, it just brought her to tears because it, there's so much going on in her life right now that, it's, that it, this was just reassuring. So let's listen to, let's look at Job. The faith of Abraham, the visions of Joseph, the obedience of Moses, the steadfastness of David, the wisdom of Solomon, these are all expressions from the Old Testament describing the great men of Scripture. And today we talk of what has been coined as the 
patience of Job. I know you've either heard or used that term in your life, the patience of Job. There, there is an expression that we've all heard and probably have all used to define someone who has the virtue we all wish we had. Patience. Not my virtue. Anyway, many years ago, I had a discussion with my dad. You all remember my dad, Deacon Leonard. And um, I had been invited to do a Vespers, actually, where Phyllis and I now live. But I had been invited uh, when I was at St. Jude's to come over to, to the village and, and do a Vesper one night. And it just happened to be on, on Job, on this subject. And so I, I spoke to my dad, and I told him I was preaching from one of his favorite books of the Bible. I was preaching from Job. Um, he hesitated for a moment, as some of you would probably remember him doing, giving me time to realize I might have been mistaken. Well, I asked, isn't he one of your favorites? My dad kind of stuttered like he was known to do, and when he didn't, when he didn't want to correct you, and he answered finally, not really. I have a problem with Job being said to have patience. It doesn't seem to me he was very patient at all. And then, so as to not hurt my feelings, he said, well, maybe, I guess so. He replied to me with patience. <sighs> yeah, I guess the reason I always thought of him to like Job is because we always used to describe my father as being patient. In his younger years, maybe, when, when my dad would preach at church, I would learn things about him I never knew about him, but he would often tell stories on me. Today I'm getting even. <laughs> Let me tell you a story on him, because when we talk about patience, I recall one time when I was uh, young, very young, you know, many of you know that my mother was born here in Apopka and was raised in Apopka and moved to Michigan. Her family moved when she was 18. But So we'd come down for vacation every year because my mother wanted to come home. <clears throat> and once we were coming through Kentucky, now this is before I-75 and I-95 and all This was going through towns. You remember that? Two-lane highways. And we came through this one town, and my dad pulled up behind a, a red light and, and we sat there, and the light turned green. Nobody moved. The light turned red, still hadn't moved. Light turned, now, my dad hasn't honked a horn. He hasn't yelled. He hasn't lifted um, a particular digit from his hand. He, he's just sitting there very patiently waiting for the traffic to move. Light changed three times. And then I looked over, and I said, Dad, you're in the parking lane. <laughs> he pulled off to what he thought was an outside lane, and it was parking lane. Patience. My dad, my dad had patience. Anyway, uh, I think his patience kind of ebbed over the years, and maybe he wasn't as patient as I remember him in his younger years. I mean, I'd take him to the doctor before he passed when, when he was here, and we'd go to the doctor, and I'd, I'd listen to him complain of how long it takes to see the doctor. I watched him impatiently wanting to get his strength back. He had outlived two wives, you know, my mother and my stepmother, and, but he had to deal with his own health. So how does this connect with the lesson for Job? Well, like Job, the question may not be about patience, but about faith and integrity. Hmm. Or at least patience to hold on to faith and to maintain integrity. Like Job, my dad, excuse me, my dad's faith Though tested, never wavered. Though tested, never wavered. Today, I'm going to try and present a couple of different ways to look at the story of Job and how he is perceived not only by scholars, but by us as we try to understand the poem. The story of Job is in the form of a poem. I'd ask you to consider it if you were to face what Job had to face, how or which way would you react? We got brothers and sisters in North Carolina and Georgia and parts of Florida that are now without anything. 
without home, without car, without phone, many without food, many without water. It seems that they're facing what Job had to face. So I'd ask you, how, how would you react to that? Job was a good man, not necessarily a wise man, but a good man. In his story, this great poem of a man suffering begs the question of the apparently undeserved suffering of man that recurs over and over. It's the, sta it's the standard question. What have I done to deserve this bad, this evil? What have I done to deserve losing everything? Why has this happened to me? The story sets out from the very beginning to show the reasons for human sufferings often remains a secret to human beings. We don't read in the poem where, where God pulled Job aside. He pulled him aside and explained, Job, let me explain this bet that Satan and I have about you. That didn't happen. He never said so this poem concerns a righteous man who for no reason is deprived of all of his rewards, uh, re rewards of his righteousness. And the book begins with a description of Job. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. In chapter 2, God and Satan are doing this conversation, and it probably goes something like this. God asks Satan, he says, what you been up to, Satan? He said, well, I've been roaming the world. I've been just walking over. I, I took a Viking cruise. I went to Royal Caribbean. I just, I've been all over the world. And you, you know what, God? You got a lot of lousy people down here. And they all belong to me. And God says back to Satan, well, wait a minute. I've got a very honorable and righteous man named Job down there. Have you thought to look at him? And then the story progresses, and they get this thing going between them. And God agrees to let Satan do whatever he wants to Job, short of killing Job. Because Satan wants to prove that if you take away stuff from man, they're going to curse you, they're going to reject you, they're going to blame you. And God says, no, Job will stay upright and righteous. And so the contest begins. So anyway, the first thing that comes is uh, uh, Satan gives Job uh, boils all over his body. All over his have you ever had boils? When I was a boy, I used to get them on the bottom of my feet to where I couldn't even walk. They were so painful. So he's covered in boils. And his wife turns to him and says, why don't you just admit it? Why don't you curse God and die? Job says, typical woman reaction. I don't know why he said that, but that's what the Bible said he said. And he says to her, when we accept what God gives us in good, should we not also accept what we get that's bad? You know, I told the story, and I've told you this many times, about Paul Pearson. I think it was Paul. He gets the credit anyway. But Paul, the carpenter, he one time when I was with him, hit his thumb with a hammer. And instead of doing expletives like I might have done, he looked up and said, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Well... So anyway, the, the contest begins. <clears throat> Basically, Job loses everything. He loses his kids, loses his animals, loses his farm. He just loses everything. Lost his cable TV. All gone. And so anyway, he, but Joe, uh, God said he'll hold on to his integrity. Well, the next thing that happens, we understand the book of Job concerns itself with the question of faith in a sovereign God. Can God be trusted? Is he good and just in his rule for the world? Do you accept that? Job will declare outwardly that God had wronged him. But at the same time, Job is certain that God, his, at the time, enemy, is actually his advocate and eventually will vindicate him. That's faith. He doesn't know why God's done this to him, why God's taken everything away from him, but he knows in the end he, he'll be vindicated. Many years ago when Father Bauman was the rector here and I, I was just a lowly little lay person coming into the church every now and with my head down, feeling sorry for myself. And 
Father Bauman would call me in his office, and for our children's sake, I'm going to clean it up, but he'd say, Ed, it seems like God's really ticked you off. He didn't use tick, but that, that's close enough. And I'm, I'm ducking thunderbolts. No, 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 no. I, no, he, he hasn't made me mad. I'm, I'm all for you, God. I'm, I'm okay. And then Father Bauman turned to me and said, Ed, it's okay. God has broad shoulders. You can get mad at him if you want. It's okay to get mad, but you have to maintain your faith and your dedication to the God. <clears throat> now, the point is we can all at times feel like God is picking on us, taking from us, and not giving us what we want or, <clears throat> or what we think <clears throat> we, we need or, or deserve. And so we read this poem of Job. Now, it's not enough that Job has lost everything except, of course, his wife. Odd that this is on the same page with divorce, isn't it? But he's still got his wife. And so uh, not only is she telling him to curse God and die, but now three of his best friends come over to console him and console him. And what do they tell him? It's pretty obvious that God is true and faithful and, and that, that God uh, would not mess up. He wouldn't make a mistake. And if God is true and faithful and, and, and uh, omnipotent and all these other things and would never make a mistake, then there's got to be the reason. And the reason, Job, is because you sinned. God would never do that to anybody. But if you sinned, that's why you lost everything. And they're counseling him, too. They're, matter of fact, they're telling him the same thing. Why don't you just admit it, curse God, and die? But Job insists that suffering comes from God. He says, I am innocent, therefore. Uh, I am innocent, therefore. God is unjust. Well, friends say he should admit his sins and died, but wouldn't that kind of be the easy way out? In my law enforcement days, I, I can tell you that there were occasions when somebody would uh, be arrested, and whether they were guilty or not, a lot of sometimes, not a lot of times, but sometimes they would plead innocent or plead guilty to a lesser offense so that they wouldn't have to take a chance of going to prison for longer periods. I could never understand that, how a man, if innocent, would actually confess to doing something to get a shorter time in jail, but, but they, they would do that. But not Job. He stands up for his integrity. He holds on to his faith, or did he? Some would say it wasn't as much out of faith as it was out of fear of God. How about this angle? It was a self-fulfilled prophecy. If we look at Job through Satan's eyes, maybe we see a man who fears God and avoids evil because he realizes the penalties, and I think we do that. Job worries about making the slightest mistake. Actually, if you go into the first chapter of Job, uh, Job's children would get together periodically. They would have a family dinner, a Sunday afternoon dinner. You bring the fried chicken, you bring the corn and the cob, we'll have a meal. But what he would do after the meal, he loved his children, but he was so concerned that maybe they weren't doing what they should be doing, that he would anoint them after every meal, and then he would get down on his knees and pray for his children, just in case they had done something against God, or just in case they had sinned. Whether they did or not didn't matter, because Job didn't want to take the chance. Now, that's the fear, the fear of punishment. It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God, he would say, he didn't know whether uh, or not any of them actually sinned, but he wasn't going to take any chances. I wonder, do we do that? When things seem to be going in our favor, do we wait for the proverbial other shoe to fall? I mean, we've all been in a frame of mind when we said things couldn't get worse. I used to say that. My favorite line was, cheer up, things could be worse. So I cheered up, and sure enough, they got worse. It was if Job, if Job expected things to go wrong. As a matter of fact, at the climax of his first, the first speech in the poem, 
Job confesses that his worst fears have happened. His nightmare has come true. It's true that anxieties have a habit of projecting themselves from psychological to physical reality. And Job's premonition turned out to be accurate, but somewhere he knew that he was precariously balanced in his goodness like a triangle on his apex, just waiting to be topped over. And then there, there's always that perverse sense of relief. I don't know if it's ever happened to you, but isn't it strange how some people, when we worry about something being bad, that something bad's going to happen, when it finally happens, you're almost relieved? So where are we? It should be a given that we will never know why misfortune falls on us. Remember, in the beginning, the reason for human suffering remains a secret to human beings. We know Job lost everything, but God still calls him blameless and upright, and he remained so. Remember, I said Job was a good man, but not necessarily a wise one. It wasn't until much later in the poem, when he had dialogue with God, that he finally began to get the picture. But you'll have to read further into Job to see how the story ends. So, would we find ourselves remaining faithful to God, even if we thought ourselves innocent of any wrongdoing and not deserving of human suffering? Or, or would we see ourselves as fearful of a God and not willing to do anything wrong for fear of punishment? Maybe we try to hold on to things tightly because we're afraid we might lose them and worry so much that it actually becomes real. I had a glass that's one of my favorite glasses, and I had, I had a little tea in, in my glass. And when I finished, it's my favorite glass, and I set it on the table beside me, and I've always worried about it. I take care of that. I wash it, hand wash it. Well, I reached for something, knocked it out, and it shattered into a million pieces. Reality, self-fulfilling prophecy. I worried about that little glass so much that it actually got broken. Well, when we find ourselves remaining faithful to our God, even if we thought ourselves innocent of any wrongdoing and not deserving of human suffering, or, or would we see ourselves as fearful of a God and not willing to do anything wrong for fear of punishment? Do we, what choice would we make? Maybe we try to hold on to things tightly because we're afraid we might lose them, like my glass. Here's the final point. And I've been trying to make and this is why this 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 lesson or this gospel is so important to us today is because we're at that time right now we've got it coming right off the shore very shortly we've got friends up in the Carolinas and family and, and those that we're praying for over 260 dead we're very familiar with hurricanes and the destruction they can cause but only a strong foundation can survive the fury of a storm. While rooftops fly away and walls crumble, good foundations survive. The foundation of a building must be deep enough and solid enough to hold up a building. And after a storm, that solid foundation can be used for rebuilding. Lives are like buildings. If inferior material is used when the final test comes, lives will crumble like a building on a weak foundation. Job was tested about his life, but his life was built on God, and he endured. We must analyze our own lives, check our foundations, and we may be strong enough and have enough faith and integrity to be able to say, when all else is gone but God, when all else is gone but God, God is enough. God is enough. Uh, there was a, I took a quote from one of my sources is a life application study Bible, but I want to leave you with this because it really struck me. It's easy to think that we have all the answers. In reality, only God knows exactly why things happen as they do, and we must submit to him as our sovereign. We should emulate Job and decide to trust God no matter what happens. Amen. Now please stand and let us 
renew our faith through the reciting the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scripture. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may kneel or be seated for the prayers of the people. The prayers of the people will be Form 3 found on page six in your bulletin or in the Book of Common Prayer on page 387. We will pray responsively. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, Justin, our bishop, Gregory, retired bishop, Dabney, assisting bishop, Father Ed, our priest in charge, the Anglican Church of Paul, New Guinea, St. Luke's Church, Merritt Island, St. Edward's Church, Mount Dora, and the Reverend Mark Laffler, and for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for President Joseph Biden, Governor Ron DeSantis, Mayor Brian Nelson, and for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble that they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed, especially Burton Gottschall, eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. And together, let's say the prayer for Holy Spirit found in your bulletin. O oh, Heavenly Father, we, your parish family, at your Church of the Holy Spirit, come together in one voice asking for your hand in our lives. We believe that all things are possible through you. We also believe your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, commanded us to make disciples of all nations. The doors of the Church of the Holy Spirit are always open to anyone seeking a place to learn about and worship you. We seek your guidance in reaching out to the community and bringing those who hunger for the word into our fold. We know that without you, we can do nothing and you will do nothing. 
and just show the power of your love to all among you whom we live through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Heavenly Father, you have promised to hear what we ask in the name of your Son. Accept and fulfill our petitions, we pray, not as we ask in our ignorance nor as we deserve in our sinfulness, but as you know and love us in your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. <clears throat> Amen. Now let us kneel and confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And now please stand, and may the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you.
<laughs> All right, we do have to have some visitors. Um, Lynette has a son and his lady friend. It's nice to have them with us. Um, let's see, who else have we got visiting with us? I'm glad to see Susan's back from trips and all kinds of stuff. Um, looks good. Well, and Donna brought her cousin. Nice to have you with us. Birthdays, um, Owen's birthday is this week. That's Lori's husband, Owen Bachelor. Katie Messina, right? Um, Angela, and we'll maybe see her later, but we'll send blessings via thing. David said David's birthday is today. I don't see Sandy. Is she here? No, not yet. Okay. Uh, Cindy Schaefer and Ray True Blood, come on up. And also uh, Ken Anders' birthday is this week as well. I understand he's still in rehab. Is that right, Angela? But he's doing better. He's back in rehab. I guess he fell. I'm not going to sing to you. Let me go to the other end. All right, that's better. Oh, God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace, strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you both. And remain with you always. Happy birthday. Thank you. Together. Wow. A day apart. A day apart. We'll go spend a lot of money on each other. <laughs> okay, let's see, do I have anything else? Uh, anniversaries, this, we've talked about that. WOC workshops still doing on Friday and... Travel. No? no. Travel. Oh, travel. Are you traveling again? Are you are you going back over to the to the kingdom? Okay. Okay. And y'all are going home? We're going home to Ohio. I'm going to Alabama for my uncle's funeral. We're doing a lot of that lately, aren't we? O oh God, our Heavenly Father, whose glory fills the whole creation, whose presence we find wherever we go, preserve those who travel and surround them with your loving care, protect them from every danger, and bring them in safety to their journey's end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Safe travel. Are you, are you flying over or swimming? <laughs> I'm going to fly. Okay. All right, um, we're following this service with a potluck and um, <clears throat> the monthly forum meeting. And then at 1.30, we're still going to do the pet blessing. If anybody shows up, I'll be there. If it gets to be a problem, if most people can't make it or whatever, you know, we could always reschedule. But 1.30 in the courtyard, I'll be there with playing St. Francis. So... Um, monthly forum meeting. I'm going to tell you some things are going on. I'm going to have other people speak. Then we're going to eat. Then you got time to go home and get your dogs and cats and armadillos and, and bring them back for the, the blessing. Ascribe to the Lord the honor to his name. Bring offerings and come into his courts.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right, good, and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. <laughs> Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is seated as you're able. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace, and at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them, feed on them in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. 
This is the Lord's table. All baptized Christians are invited to receive. And now let's pray our prayer of intention for those viewing us online. In union, O Lord, with the faithful of every, at every altar of your church where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, I desire to offer you praise and thanksgiving. I present to you my soul and body with the earnest wish that they may always be united to you. I remember your death, Lord Christ. I proclaim your resurrection. I await your coming in glory. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you and embrace you with all the affections of my soul. Let nothing ever separate you from me. May I live and die in your love. Amen.
Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with the spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Now may God, who gives patience and encouragement, give you a spirit of unity to live in harmony as you follow Jesus Christ, so that with one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and remain with you always. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Forget the multitudes whom you have made like you. Yes, God, it's in your image we were made to know the saving work and grace of Jesus Christ.
mission we will go to be the light of kingdom hope until you the prayer.